Well, Merry Christmas or Christmas Eve, really. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here to celebrate the birth of your son. Thank you for the long-awaited gift that we are the beneficiaries of on this side of his birth. Think of all those who looked forward to what you were doing and in hope held tight. And Lord, we look back and we know what you did. And we still see new work in each one of our lives as you grow us up from the inside. I pray, Lord, that as we go through your word, that it might have meaning, that it might stir something in the depths of each one of us. Because, Lord, you know that there are some here hurting. And there are some here that uh, are celebrating a Christmas without a loved one. And there are so many memories tied up with this event. And yet, Lord, you are the featured attraction. And I pray that you might be that for each one of us here today. So, Lord, I pray that you might encourage us all by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're, we're going to the book of Hebrews today. No, we're not going backward. We're going forward. Uh, for those of you who wish you could be in warmer climates, this is how they celebrate. Which I always find it unusual because on, on the southern hemisphere, they celebrate their, their winter and our summer and, and vice versa, which is real interesting. But I don't know, just being somewhere that's really warm and, and Santa in shorts on a surfboard, just, I don't know, just doesn't feel like Christmas. But there are people doing it, and I, I think that's amazing. But we're here without snow just yet. We're looking at the Christmas story, and most of it is found in the book of Luke and in chapters 1, 2, and 3 about the birth of Jesus Christ. Chapter one talks about this character, this persona, John the Baptist, who takes on uh, an Elijah sort of ministry, announcing that there's a birth that has come, that Jesus the Christ has come, the long awaited, the long prophesied Messiah of Israel. And he was born in advance and just so happened they're related, it's his cousin. And we see the angel, um, coming to Zechariah and saying, hey, your prayer has been heard. Your wife is going to bear a son and you'll call him John. How would you like that? And he's in his old age and he goes, how's that going to happen? It's the Jersey version that says that. Um, and he says, I'm Gabriel. I stand at the throne of God and you're not going to say a word until the day he's born. And he lost his voice, much like my poor wife this morning. Yeah, she'll find it. It's okay. <laughs> she loses things periodically. And so he's quiet until the day he's born. When he's born, his wife has the privilege of saying, we're going to call him John. And everybody's aghast because there's no one named John in your family. You've got to be carrying on a family name. And so they ask Zachariah, so what's his name? Since he has kind of the, the order. And he says, his name is John. And in that simple act of obedience, his voice is loosed and suddenly he catches up with all of his words he's been missing and he busts loose. Isaiah 40 verses three and four says, the voice of one who's crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make straight a desert, a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth, basically John the Baptist would come in and prime everybody for the birth of Jesus and his message that would come. And John was the guy to do that. We saw that in the previous chapter. In Malachi 4, 5, and 6, another prophecy, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. The very last word of that line is the very last word in the Old Testament. The Old Testament ends with a curse. It's rather interesting. And the New Testament, if you look in the book of Revelation, it ends with a blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And that's how it ends. So it's a rather interesting ending to the book of the law and of all the prophets. And yet we have, a, we have a better way because Jesus came. 
In verse 1 of chapter 2 of Luke, it says, And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. And all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. The Jews are very, very careful about property and ownership because you pass it down in your family. You can't sell a piece of property to anybody. It has to stay in your family. And so they all gathered for the census. The Jews probably imposed this, although the Romans were the ones who were doing the counting. Then it was Augustus, and that's not his real name. He gave himself that name. It means like God. Hey, what's your name? Like God. It's a little arrogant. So Caesar Augustus makes this proclamation. His name's really Gaius Octavius. So um, for you history buffs, which there's probably one of you. And he gathered them together and took numbers so that he might tax them. Does that sound familiar? You live in Jersey. Yes. And just so you understand, that's, that's roughly uh, Biden's tax code. Um, it's all been broken down and, by, by somebody who knows way more than I do, who counts these things. There's only two reasons that you ever count people in a census. One is because you're going to make a draft and you want to find all eligible men to go out and do battle. Or number two, for the money. He was doing this for the money and everybody gathered. By the way, doesn't Putin look like Octavius? Just a little slight curiosity I have. Uh, cheekbones, a kind of sad face, yeah, kind of same thing. The Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome, came at a cost. The Roman Empire, which got so incredibly large, their, their reach exceeded their grasp, but uh, they put up 50,000 miles of roads. And of course, they had to station soldiers throughout all of these roads to protect the peace of Rome. And uh, that cost money. And so they did all that they could to collect as much from the people that they uh, usurped. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, which means house of bread, because he was of the house and lineage of David. It's rather curious. It should make your ears perk up if you're a historian, because the Messiah would come from the line of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. Now, if you're ever planning a long trip, don't do it with a woman in her third trimester. <laughs> and yet, God said, this is what you need to do. And he used an evil empire and an evil Caesar to accomplish his goals, to get both of these people in the place where it was prophesied, the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, Ephrathah. I just find it interesting that God works all things together for good, for those that love him and are the called according to his purpose. And it applies even in this case. And so he takes his pregnant wife on a 100 mile journey without cars, buses, planes, trains, You, you get the idea? How many of you have been pregnant? Men, don't you dare raise your hand. I, I, I believe you've had a son or a daughter, but I don't believe you've ever been pregnant. That wall has not been broken. And so you've got, I, I love this picture of, of Joseph. It's like, all right. Well. I mean, how would you like to find out that your girlfriend who you're engaged to is pregnant, and she says, God did it. That's a little hard to swallow. Just when you think you have a hard time, think about the story. God chose to come in the form of a baby to an unwed mother who was probably 14 or 15 years old. So when you get all clamping down on your kids because they're dating and they're 17, 18, remember Mary was pregnant in her teens. And Joseph says, well, what are you going to do? Luckily, the Lord spoke to him and he was a just man. He was a good man. And he didn't want to put her away. He didn't want to like cancel the, the agreement and cancel the wedding. 
because if he did and they found out she was pregnant, she would have to get stoned to death for adultery. But Joseph, being a good man, said, I don't want to do that to Mary. She's a good woman. And so he wanted to put her away privately. So he didn't, didn't want her to suffer any, any trouble. Um, he's like, listen, I, I know it wasn't me, so I, I, we can't do this. And then the Lord came and spoke to him. And he says, don't be afraid to take Mary, your wife, because that which is in her is of the Holy Spirit. So what she's telling you is the truth. And so he ends up marrying her, but he doesn't have any relationship physically with her until after Jesus is born. And unlike many of the rumors you hear, she had children after Jesus. Jesus had brothers and sisters, and they're listed in the book of Mark, actually. So he had several brothers and probably several sisters that were not mentioned. So you've got Mary going to Bethlehem, maybe on the back of a donkey. And this is, you know, a, a 90 mile journey or 100 miles or so, depending on where you counted from and which path they took. But, you know, usually you could travel maybe 20 miles in a day, but not with a woman in her third trimester because you got to find all of the bathrooms along the way. <laughs> Any of you know what I'm talking about? Uh, I got to go. You just went. I know. <laughs> I just, okay, good. So this is a common thing. So it's, you're talking about a seven to nine day journey. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. Oh, perfect timing. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, basically rags, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, those of you who have a manger at home, you think it's this cute little outhouse uh, looking structure, you know, with, you know, little animals in there and some hay, but it's actually a stone feeding trough. So imagine having that sort of hard mattress. It's a stone mattress. It's a stone thing that animals would eat out of. And it's interesting that the bread of life would come to the house of bread and be put in a trough where you would put food because he's the, he's the bread of life that each of us has to eat and therefore live. And so Micah 5.2 says, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, which, by the way, there's more than one Bethlehem, because there's one in Pennsylvania. So it's like that. They have other Bethlehems. And so it's, it's saying it's in a very specific area. And though you were a little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth were from old, from everlasting. So this is in Micah chapter, two, uh, chapter 5, verse 2, about how the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. And that's how they were able to tell the wise guys later where he was going to be born. So the wise men came and asked. And so most of you probably have something that looks like this. And you say, oh, isn't that nice? A little roof in case it rains. You know, you're laying on the hay. That's not so bad. It's almost like living in a barn, right? With one wall. And it's not this kind of inn that you might be familiar with. It's not a holiday inn, a red roof inn. It's not a... You know, it's none of those inns, not the Holiday Inn, the Ramada Inn. It's no inn like you understand an inn to be. This is what it is. It's called a caravansary, which is where caravans would come with all of their animals and they would put them inside of this structure. And along the outside wall, sometimes one, sometimes four of them, there would be little rooms off to the side that you could sleep in and your animals would end up in the inside of the pen. They would close the gate and your animals wouldn't get away. And then you wake up in the morning and nobody, nobody uh, jumps your ride and, you know, away you go. So this is where they didn't have room. It's, they didn't, it's not the Holiday Inn they didn't have room. They didn't have room in this joint, which was for travelers that went across the country. And they would bring camels and, and donkeys and sheep. And they would just, they'd be able to just kind of, it's the, uh, the old school hostel, if you will. And so they were pretty much under the stars. So it wasn't this, this cute little place. And the interesting thing is as we went along, people built this into a monument. This is actually where they believe Jesus was born. It once was just a little kind of an outcropping of rock. And it kind of went in like a, almost like a cave. And they're saying that's where Jesus was actually born. I mean, ladies, can you imagine 
dropping a baby in a cave with a man who's never seen any of that and have to deliver a child by yourself or with this man who knows nothing of what he's doing. You think you got it rough. My goodness, this is difficult. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. I always feel like I should speak in Linus voice when I say this. But this is, this is what Linus says when he says, this is what Christmas is all about, like Charlie Brown. There are some notable shepherds, it's rather interesting, Abel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Rachel, Moses, David, Job, and Amos, just to name a few. It was a, it was a pretty um, prolific job that people would have, and yet shepherds were very disrespected because they would come in from the field after being out there for months, no showers. They tended to have nothing. They were kind of like vagrants. And so you would find things missing and you knew it was because the shepherds came to town. They were kind of, the kind of people you watch out for because they're not used to being with people. Uh, and there's good reason sometimes for that. But these are notable shepherds and it's interesting that it's the, it's the town of David David was a shepherd, wasn't he? And here, the angels make a special appointment to tell the nobodies of that society. Like today, it might be garbage men. Forgive me if you're a garbage man. But a garbage man after a long day, I would never compare them to a shepherd. Shepherds picking up animals and picking up after animals and smelling like sheep. You ever smell a sheep? You ever smell a wet dog? That's nothing. In Micah 4.8, and you, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, you shall, and to you shall it come, even the former dominion shall come, the kingdom of the daughter of Jerusalem. So there's this promise that this would come to this area and that they would, they would know. In verse 10, and the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for all the people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, a savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Okay, how is that a sign? I mean, you could find babies lying in cradles everywhere, right? But you know what? It's gonna be real interesting to find one in a manger laying in a feeding trough. You don't put babies in feeding troughs, right? It's like the dog bowl at your house. You would never put your baby there or in a bowl of Cheerios. You would never do that. And yet that's kind of what they did. Put him in a place and, and this will be a sign for you. The child will be soaking in milk and Cheerios. Yep, that's the one. Isaiah 7:14 says, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin and the word means virgin, not young woman. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So if anybody wonders why you think Jesus is God incarnate, it's because the Bible says so. It's very simple. Peter has this interesting uh, revelation in Acts 10, 34. And Peter opened his mouth and said, I, in truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. The angels went to the nobodies first. Amen. He didn't go to the king. He didn't go to the rulers. He didn't go to the politicians. He went to the nobodies Amen. out in the field. I think that's amazing. I think I qualify. How about you? Yes. Amen. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Can you imagine the sky after they get the message suddenly lighting up with a giant host that you didn't see before because they weren't there before, lighting up the sky? You know, that made it probably a bit of a distraction, right? 
I imagine there were people far away that saw it and went, what's that? Well, it's not a helicopter because they're not invented yet. What is that light in the sky? It's a little freaky, right, at night. And so they're given the news. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. Well, that seems like the next thing, right? Uh, before the sun comes up even, we better, we better get out of here and go check this out. What do you think they did with the sheep? They left them. I wonder if Jesus was thinking about this event when he told the parable of the one who had 100 sheep and one got loose and he left the 99. And so they go in joy and they go find Jesus. And so they came in haste and they found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Who would have thought? Now, when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning the child. So these are the first evangelists. They go and tell everybody about Jesus. But the funny thing is, if they go through town and they make this heralding thing where they say, Jesus has been born. Jesus is born. Well, Jesus was a really common name like John. Or around here, Dave. Dave's a common name. Or John. John's a common name. Not a common man, but a common name. Be Jesus is born. Okay, yeah, like, so what? Jesus is born. In Mexico, it would mean nothing. It's like that. And so they go and they shout all this great news. And they go and tell. It's like show and tell, but it's different. Isn't that what we should do? Yes. Amen. Because Jesus has come to us. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then the shepherds returned, glorifying and pra praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen and was told them. I find it interesting the way the two different responses of these two. You've got the shepherds who hear this news and they're excited. They can't shut up. They're telling everybody. And Mary's just pondering it, thinking it over, storing it away in her heart so that she might tell a young man named Luke one day to write it down, of which we are the beneficiaries of. And so Mary thinking about this, and of course this was all taken by Luke as he gets the story probably from Mary. So that's how we get the first person story in the book of Luke. And when he was eight days were completed, the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. I want you to think about this. This was just Joseph and Jesus. Mary was not allowed to go in because she just had a baby. And there's a 42-day period of time she would have to wait because she had a boy child. It would be 66 days if she had a girl child according to Leviticus, because of the issue of blood and healing and all of that and all of the rules concerning blood and, and uh, I won't get into it. But so there's a 42 day wait period as Joseph is going to take him to the moil. Any of you have a son saw him circumcised? I did. It, it gives you kind of a funny feeling in your belly. Like There were muscles tightening up when I, when I saw all of this, but you know, you, you go see the moil. Hey, on the eighth day, it's actually the perfect day to actually do it. And the, the word says you should, because vitamin K is prolific in your body at that time. And it's the best time to coagulate any kind of a, an injury. And God had it all figured out before science ever made it a deal. And so you go to the, you go to the rabbi, you go to the moil, it's when taking tips is your profession. <laughs> your job is a moil, and that's your circumcision joke for the day. Yeah, Merry Christmas Eve. All right, second event. Now, when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were completed, I told you it's 42 days, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. 
As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So now there's this completion where she's finally cleansed of her blood flow and she's all back on track. Hormones are all balanced out and she can now go before the presence of the Lord. But she's got a firstborn male. The firstborn males, according to the Lord in the law, they belong to him because of what happened in Egypt when they were all rescued because they put the blood on the lintel and the doorposts and all of the firstborns were preserved. He said, from now on, the firstborn's mine. And you literally have to buy them back from God, which seems fair since he owns everything. And so you have to go there and present. Now, usually you bring a lamb, but because they were so poor, they only brought a couple of doves, which there's a provision in the law for if you weren't rich. And so they bring a couple of, uh, if you were looking for it, it's in Leviticus chapter 12. And so they bring a couple of doves. One is a whole burnt offering and the other um, is a sin offering. So they're, 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 both, um, they're both dead, but it's the sacrifice that you give. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death until he had seen the Lord's Christ. And so he came by the Spirit into the temple. So you got this really, really old guy hanging around the temple who the Lord said, you're not going to die until the Christ comes and you're going to actually see him. In 1 John 3, 2 and 3, it says, Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we, should, what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. There's something about that hope that when we see the Lord, he's going to melt away all those imperfections in our life. That's one of those things that helps to purify us. This was his hope. The Lord spoke to him and said, you, you'll see the Messiah before you die. And he was getting really old. You know how that is. You start looking at your watch and you say, I think I have more days behind me than in front of me. And he was wondering, hmm, is God going to do what he said? Well, he always does, but you don't really know, no, until it happens. And so this was a hope that kept him going. I, I, I put this, you become like the things that you look at and listen to. Yep. If, you, if you just, you know, cruise through YouTube, you'll become like those people. You put on CNN, you'll become like those people. You become like the people you spend time with, the things that you look at, the things that you study. That's who you become like. So pick good friends, right? When the parents brought the child Jesus to do to him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all the peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. You see, he recognized that Jesus was that child, having never met him. He knew. He calls Jesus our salvation, our light, and the glory of God. Those are excellent descriptors. And so he's moved by the Spirit of God to say these things, and so they're written here for our learning. And it's interesting, salvation is a person. Amen. It's not a work. It's not something you do. It's not belonging to a church. It's not, uh, you know, doing good things. It's not, you know, kneeling down, standing up, kneeling down, standing up. That doesn't get you there. Or any, any good thing that you might do. It's about receiving a free gift that God gave to us 2,000 years ago. And Joseph and his mother, Jesus' mother, marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Notice the inward thoughtfulness of all of these actions toward them. And Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And so he tells him the prophecy of he's going to come and people are going to have to make a choice. They're either going to be with him or against him. 
And it's going to separate people. Jesus said it himself when he was here. He says, don't think that I've come to bring peace. I've come to bring a sword of separation. So that mother would be against her daughter and her mother-in-law would be against, well, that happens naturally, but mother-in-law against <laughs> daughter-in-law. And because of Jesus, he's the one that kind of separates everything out. And you're either with him or you're against him. Jesus was clear about that. And now he's prophesying that, that yes, a sword will pierce you as well. It's interesting. Jesus actually was pierced when he was up on the cross. And, she, and he said, your soul will be pierced as well. Because she had to watch all this. You remember, she and the women were the only ones really at the foot of the cross, with the exception of John, the disciple. So... He prophesies all of these things in advance that they're going to happen. And they had to, I mean, imagine having a child and knowing you will have to let this child go and watch them suffer and die. That's a very difficult situation. Now there was one, Anna. We've got, we've got, we got a man who's there, an old guy in the temple. We got an old woman. There was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phenuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and she lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years. Somebody doing math? Who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke to him to all those who looked for redemption of Jerusalem. And so when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew up, became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So we have the story of this woman, Anna, who's in the temple, and she recognizes Jesus for who he is. And she began telling everybody. She was, she was a widow for 87 years, she had had a husband for seven years from her virginity. And if they were married at 15, what's 15, 84, and 7? She's of great age, just exactly like the scripture says. That's... And what is she doing? She's spending time in the house of God, serving and praying and worshiping and witnessing. And this woman is definitely a star and uh, worthy of listening to. And so that is basically the short story of the birth of Jesus. Which I'm sure you've heard many, many times and probably read through on your own. And there's lots of archeological finds. Uh, Quirinius being governor in Syria, he actually had two terms. And anyway, so there's all this stuff to unpack. So I would encourage you guys to figure it out and look at it. It's a historical book unlike any other historical book. And it tells the story of Jesus Christ who came and healed and preached and died. And he said he died for the sins of the world. If you accept him, if you ask him, and if you throw yourself at his feet and say, Lord, I'm yours, take me. I believe in you. I believe that you were risen from the dead. I believe that you're the son of God and I give you my life. I repent of my sins and I'm gonna do your will. That's what it is to be a Christian. Don't let anybody tell you you got to have a card that says that or a bumper sticker that says that or a membership somewhere or you have to give a lot of money. It's not that at all. It's about giving everything. It's about giving our lives to Jesus. Amen. Amen.